So this week's episode was absolutely just crazy. Now, knowing exactly, you know, pretty much what was going to happen, and we've known for a few weeks, obviously, that Nana Hoshi was going to show up based on the trailers and everything. But obviously, Rudis doesn't know that at this point until this episode today. And with that whole situation going on and Shelfie's, you know, insecurities finally starting to take a toll on her mental health and everything, this episode is great. So let's just delve into this episode and we'll discuss a little more afterwards. So in the beginning, you got Shelfie, the princess, and Mr. Mr. Grey Rat over here walking down the hallways. And out of nowhere, Rudis comes running out. And he's with our, one, of our, one of our favorite little wolfy girls. And she's running down the hallways with her with her some type of meat, you know, because for some reason Persina always has to have meat. And Rudis is trying to get her to go to class and everything. And they're just goofing off, you know. And he's Rudis is starting to eat it to get like, you know, obviously get her to, like, to distract away from the whole situation. And while they're doing that, you know, Shelfie's kind of thinking to herself, like, you know, is that that's the kind of girl Rudy, Rudy likes, you know, like obviously being insecure and not exactly thinking about anything completely runs into the wall, <laughs> which is going to be pretty common for the first half of this episode, for sure. She just keeps freaking getting distracted, thinking about Rudis and not confronting the situation. So that's uh, definitely distracting her from her surroundings. We go to the princess, you know, sitting with Shelfie and everything. And she, she like brings up the point that Shelfie, you know, likes to stare at Rudis every time they go past him. And of course, when she says that, Shelfie spills her ink everywhere, all over her papers and gets all nervous and everything. And obviously the princess kind of like pokes at the fact that, you know, he must have completely forgotten you, you know, for even for as strongly as you feel about him. And that's where we get this moment where obviously Shelfie's like, you know, I haven't even told him my name yet. And it's 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 one of those things where those two were even surprised about this, like because that's all she's been talking about, you know, since they really met is finding her parents and Rudis and everybody else. But mostly I would assume Rudis and her parents, but just the fact that, you know, she hasn't seen Rudis since they were just children, you know. And she feels hopeless, obviously, and doesn't really know what to do about the situation. And it's it's one of those things where it's like, sure, you can... I totally understand the fact that, you know, she wants it to be the right scenario and all that fun stuff. But at the same time, it's like, Shelfie, girl. Just, you gotta you got freaking tell them. <laughs> So we chance over to Rudis, and he's still reading more things about the uh, teleportation slash summoning and kind of realizing that, like, the differences um, to an extent, how one calls upon somebody while the other one sends them away. And obviously there's not much written about it because they haven't really delved into that exactly in this world and time. So... Rudis is looking and he sees Shelfie and they're talking a little bit. And he, Shelfie remembers that there is somebody that is a specialist at summoning, not necessarily teleportation, and that's the uh, the the student Silent Seven Star, which obviously we we know that that's that's our uh, that's our girl Nanahoshi, and so. Rudis is uh, getting to go and check her out, and while he does that, he gets to the room, and instantly realizes who she is, right, from the mask and everything, and she tells him, you know, like, it's been a while, hasn't it, and of course, he runs out of there panicking, right, PTSD, hardcore gripping his chest, because, well, the last time he seen her, he got a he, he got a little hole in him, you know. <laughs> Granted, it wasn't her fault per se; it was more Orsted than anything. However, that's what happened last time, and this is this is the repercussions of his PTSD. And so she comes and confronts him in the hallways, and you know, and telling him that you know it's not it's not really polite to run away from somebody, especially when you're the one that came and knocked on her door. So. He passes out, right? Just clearly just blacks out, passes out. 
wakes up on Shelfie's lap, getting his head pat or head rubs on the thighs, you know, and kind of like pretty much just discussing, you know, how gentle the hands were and how familiar it felt. And it's like, dude, come on, man. I get it. But come on. Wake up. <laughs> and so obviously he wakes up and Shelfie's there and we get the Nihongo. Uh, can't even talk subtitles on the bottom on top of the regular English so obviously they're trying to point out that he's speaking the tongue of that country because we're about to go into Japanese and obviously Shelfie doesn't understand Japanese but he's talking about you know a woman in a white mask almost killed him just to look up immediately and see that Nanahoshi is right there staring at them both she tells him that, you know, you know, I saved you, didn't I, last time? And, like, he comes, he, and he, he, gosh, I can't even freaking, like, describe this. It's, But, like, she tells him, you know, like, obviously I saved you last time, but you probably wouldn't remember because I guess you were technically dead already and passed out, and I told Orsted to save your life again. And so they start talking and getting to the point about how her and Orsted kind of, like, traveled the world and... The fact that um, Orsted might come back to kill him one day, depending on, you know, how he uh, lives his life, I guess. And so, like, Shelfie's curious and she wants to know how she knows Rudis. And obviously, she's thinking about, you know, how they met with the Dragon God last time and everything. And so she wants to ask him three questions because she wants to know more about Rudis. She wants to know if he knows these names right here. Shinohara Akito or Kuroki Satoshi. Second of all, she wants to know if he knows the language, which is kind of a given considering the fact that he knows what the paper name says. And the third one is she wants to know if he's one of these two people. Obviously, he's neither of those two people. And they're obviously from the same place. But we get the realization. I mean, kind of already. I mean, if you're a reader, you knew this. And it's really hard to say, you know. But it's the gal that he saved in his past life. We, it's definitely going to go way more into that later on. But at this point, that's what you get, you know. And their last memory was, you know, talking to those guys before Rudis tried to save her from the truck and truck coon took her out <laughs> just as much as it took him out truck coon's very good at taking people out it's his it's his profession <laughs> but she kind of she wants to know more about him like obviously was he from america was he from europe and you know even though he knows japanese and she kind of realizes that all oh, he's probably just obviously from japan and but at the same time, she gets a little more reassurance knowing that she's not the only person that is in there from their world. And she wants to work her way out and get back to a regular world. But obviously, Rudis closed those doors. Like, he's done. He doesn't want to go back. He has nothing to go back to. You know, he's started a better life. He completely regrets everything about his past life. So obviously, he doesn't want to go back. And... Obviously, Shelfie wants them to speak a language she can understand so she can get into this conversation. However, that doesn't quite happen yet. So, Rudis explains that he got reincarnated instead of teleported because, obviously, he was born there after he died and didn't just show up like Nana, Nana Hoshi did when she just appeared in the Asura Kingdom. And, obviously... She talks about the journey now with Orsted. How he took her around the world and that they, you know, obviously he didn't tell her much about his grudge with the man god because that's what Rudis asked, but it's a grudge nonetheless. And so, what we do discover here is that, you know, they, there's teleportation circles and they traveled the whole world within one year. And she swore secrecy not to tell about the teleportation circles or who mentioned all this stuff. But she knows that she's been summoned here by somebody. And that 
she needs to figure that out. Granted, she also knows that if there's anything that like she significantly does to alter history, that it would erase them. Kind of like, you know, in the movies and light novels and stuff. But she also mentions that she doesn't want to change anything because... She doesn't want it to be like a light novel or a manga. She just wants to get home. And, you know, she also tells Rudis the fact that she is not aging in this world and she's been there for five years now. So she's not aging. She has no mana and she has nowhere to fight. So long story short, they obviously have different goals and but they also have something they want. So within this time frame, she makes a deal with her or she makes a deal with him depending on how you look at it where she wants him to help with the experiments and with his mana because obviously Rudis has a big mana pool and she'll tell him what he wants to know and Rudis agrees to it and obviously Shelfie's looking a little bit concerned obviously not understanding anything really going on whatsoever and this is when things get interesting because now Rudis tells her to speak in common tongue and so Shelfie can understand because she was going to describe what happens when she got there. And at that very moment, she puts on two of the three rings that she has. One is for a mana shield. Two is to block against physical attacks. And the third ring that she has that is not shown here or anything is one they call Orsted. So she puts those two on and she explains how she pretty much might have caused the teleportation. And Shelfie's face just lights up with rage. And she gets up and she starts attacking her first with magic, which obviously isn't working because of the ring, and then starts trying to just bash her shield in. Because obviously, she's talking about, you know, all the things she had to go through, right? And freaking not only her, but everybody else, and her mom, and her dad, and just Rudis's family. Obviously, rightfully so, she's upset about this. And none of she knew that was something like that was going to happen, more than likely. So, Rudis pretty much gets up and just restrains her right away because none of she's like, are you just going to sit there and watch this? Or, and of course, he gets up stuff stops her even though you know she's like you know i know you suffered too all this bull crap she's a victim too is what rudis tells her and like she finally comes calms down a little bit and, and even Anaho, she realizes she probably should have phrased that better because she she pretty much knew something like that would happen so it's like girl you gotta figure your shit out <laughs> but nonetheless after that she doesn't she she pretty much explains that she didn't really understand much of what was happening either and that Rudis is kind of conflicted because if he, he, he the man god pretty much told him that you know obviously Orsted caused it but with those two you know having a grudge against each other who knows what's true who knows what's false obviously when they're speaking about each other in those kinds of terms so with that being said and done they pretty much decide to call it a day because a lot has happened here in this short amount of time between PTSD, fights, figuring things out about each other, just a bunch of crazy shit happening, right? So obviously Rudis and Shelfie are leaving and she's kind of trailing behind and catches up and trails behind and she asks her opinion, or Rudis' opinion of her and he, you know, he, he tells her, you know, she rubs me the wrong way, but it's kind of a means to an end, you know, figuring things out about what's happening and just kind of trying to get as much information as he can. And so Shelfie, you know, trusts the fact that he trusts, you know, or not necessarily trusts her, but goes with a gut feeling about that. And so Rudis actually thanks Shelfie for, you know, taking care of him when he passed out, acknowledging that she was worried. And well, obviously she was freaking worried because it's Shelfie. And that's pretty much the end of this episode to go into next week's. Uh, obviously, this was definitely not my best breakdown of this episode, and I apologize very much. It is so hot everywhere in this country right now. Ridiculous. And I am just burnt out. But I wanted to get this up for people to discuss and talk about. Probably one of the best episodes that we've gotten so far. Just seeing Shelfie's emotional rage, getting introduced to Nanahoshi, and Root is trying to confront his PTSD. It was so much put into one to set up for this final part of core one 
leading into chord two, mm, excitement. I am very, very, very much looking forward to the fact that I, it sucks. It's going to be a six month gap, but damn, it's going to be, it's going to be freaking great. So yeah, that's pretty much all I got for today's video. Thanks for sticking around. If you made it this long, please leave a like. It means a lot to me. And if you're feeling generous, hit that subscribe button also means a lot to me and i will see y'all in tomorrow's video uh this has been squids and i hope you all have a good one peace